so we can't take action on that. But if you want to talk about anything other than drones or police helicopters, talk now. Otherwise, let's move on forward. So I'd like to introduce, um, I guess I'll introduce you, uh, uh, Sergeant, uh, Deputy Chief uh, Dave Over, and then you will introduce the others. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, so again, my name is Deputy Chief Dave Hober. I'm the Deputy Chief in charge of our Patrol Bureau. Uh, with me today and giving the presentation is Captain Tim Porter, who's in charge of our Special Operations Division. And then we have Sergeant Doug Wedge, who is a Sergeant in charge of our Bomb Unit. Also present up at the table is Ernest Guzman, who facilitates uh, much of the uh, Neighborhoods Commission and then an assistant to the city manager, Angelique Gaeta. Uh, and so I'll turn it over to Ernest, or Angelique. Uh, I've got a lot of microphones up here. Uh, Ernest Guzman, um, executive assistant uh, to the uh, city manager, um, executive analyst to the city manager. Uh, I, I want to lay down some ground rules for the discussion because you're going to hear a presentation um, that uh, some of you have seen before and others that haven't. This is a, uh, uh, a blended presentation from the first feedback that occurred uh, at the uh, November uh, meeting of the, the Neighborhoods Commission. The, um, the ground rules for today's discussion are going to be fairly simple. Um, I'm going to facilitate the, uh, the questions and uh, and I'll just simply point you out and keep a, a running tally in my, in my mind of uh, folks with their questions. Um, a couple of things, though. Uh, if you could please, um, because there's quite a few people here, if you could limit your, your question to one question and not a series of follow-on questions, that would be helpful because uh, I think we all have a tendency to want to ask a lot of things. But we need to give other folks uh, a benefit of, of being able to ask their question. I will eventually come back to you if you have other questions. And uh, that way we'll keep the discussion going as, as long as we need to. Um, secondly, the ground rules are real simple. Uh, they're the, uh, the, uh, the kindergarten rules, which are be friendly with each other, respect each other, and, um, and everybody uh, uh, not necessarily enjoy themselves, but give everybody the, uh, the chance to speak and have a turn. Uh, that's that's the way that I'd like to facilitate discussions. I know this is a serious subject, uh, but if we follow those ground rules, uh, I think this will go, and everyone will have a chance to, to uh, give their comment or their opinion. Um, the And there's really two things that you'll be doing. You'll either be asking questions, which the panel will be happy to answer, or making comments. Um, and so I think the, the important thing is that uh, we pick up information from you as well as you pick up, pick up information from everybody around the table. So with those uh, ground rules, um, I'm going to go ahead and start the presentation by opening up the, uh, uh, the PowerPoint and um, Angelique, um, to my left, will be giving the introduction. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Director, uh, Ernest, is there a time limit for the speakers? Um, the time limit is, um, for if it's working reasonably, you'll have a time limit of, of a minute to ask your question. It shouldn't take any longer than that. Um, and, um, and for your comments, um, certainly you can have a little more time than that, probably at least three minutes to make a comment. Uh, but questions uh, shouldn't take that long to ask. I think everybody has a, a ch will have a chance to make a comment, but let's limit that to three minutes then. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ernest. Um, I'm Angelique Gaina, I'm an assistant to the city manager, and I'm uh, trying to help facilitate the discussion on today's topic, but also give a brief overview of the other camera programs that are being explored by the city, so they're not confused with what we're discussing today. And then um, our officers and chiefs here will um, talk about the actual unmanned aerial system. So the other programs that are being explored by the police department are the registration of privately owned cameras, the stationary cameras in hot spots, and the uh, body-worn cameras. 
the registration of privately owned cameras is a program that allows citizens and um, business owners in the city of San Jose to register the location and type of camera that they have for surveillance purposes with the police department. Um, and how that information will be used is in the event of a crime and the police department is um, trying to determine whether or not there is any footage captured by any camera or surveillance system, they will go to that program and download the addresses for, of uh, systems in that area and then have a contact person to talk to. It's a purely voluntary program. Um, it's not a program that allows the police department or the city to tap into anybody's system. It's simply a citizen or a business owner providing um, the location of the camera to assist the police department in their investigation. The stationary cameras and hotspots is a program um, approved by the council um, to position stationary cameras in hotspots that were um, actually determined by the Mayor's Gang Prevention Task Force with a focus on um, addressing graffiti and to capture people that are engaging in that crime. Um, that is still in the uh, development process and um, when that's ready, ready to roll out, we would bring that back to the Neighborhoods Commission for comments and consideration. And then finally, there's the Body Worn Cameras program. I think it pretty much speaks for itself. That program um, is also in the development phase and um, in discussions with the Police Officers Administration, or Association, excuse me. Um, but there are uh, plans to roll out a pilot program and use uh, cameras from two different vendors to see whether or not it's something that San Jose wants to um, develop further and bring to the community. And then finally, the unmanned aerial system, um, which the folks will be discussing today. Good morning. Very quickly, very quickly uh, if the commissioners in the second row could move forward, there'll be room for more people to move back to have seats here. So you can pick up the labels. Come on up. presentation is to give a background on the unmanned aerial system, how and why it's required. And also we want uh, the community's input, the suggestions for us to develop policy and procedures. And we want to describe how we'll use it in the city if we do use it. And then we'll have the discussion afterwards. We can have, we'll take your suggestions and answer your questions. Okay, this was specifically acquired for our bomb unit, and the reason why many times there's packages that they would like to take a look at to, to try to figure out if it's a live ordinance or if it's just a package, and someone said it was suspicious. Many times a bomb unit, have, we have mechanical robots that will go up onto an item, and we have a camera, and it helps the experts determine if the package is dangerous or not. Many times we cannot get to a package because it's in a location that the robot can't get to. So the, we'll have the specifics of the UAS later, but it gives the bomb technicians a real-time view at it being at a safe distance. Uh, it's also for hard-to-reach areas, like I explained, for the robot. Uh, it helps them evaluate the items. And many times they do have something that's dangerous, and they basically, in layman's turn, cover it up and detonate it. And so sometimes you obviously have to have the area clear, and you could use that UAS to monitor the area, make sure no one's there, set it down, and then they could go ahead and detonate the item. And it has not been used uh, at any um, call at all, and it's not going to be used unless the community, department, and city council deem that we can do that. The, uh, the drone is a Century Neo 660 hex rotor. It's basically anyone in this room could go purchase it at uh, a hobby shop or wherever they sell them. It weighs approximately one and a half pounds. Uh, we'll have a picture coming up. You, go ahead, go with that picture. you can see it right there. So it's three feet wide, one and a half feet tall. 
It has a standard GoPro camera that anyone in this room can purchase. And it has very limited flying time. Right now we can estimate uh, maybe 15 minutes. And also it will not operate well in any way uh, conditions over five miles an hour. Uh, yeah, uh, let me just explain. Um, I think I may have uh, put in uh, some different slides here. So the slides that were available for you to pick up and the slides that he's reading off are actually the ones that are the more current ones. So um, if you could look at your slides that are on your uh, printed material, you'll be able to follow what uh, we have uh, been reading from. Oh, uh, on that slide, it should say Neighborhoods Commission at the top. Uh, November 12th, we, we held our first meeting for the Neighborhood Commission to uh, get the public's input. Uh, the direction was given by the commissioners, and we're going to hold, and this is the meeting we're having that right now in December. We plan on having another one in a different area of the city in January, and another one um, in March, or in February. The next uh, slide you'll see, December 6th, obviously today, We'll announce the date for January. We'll announce the date for February. And then in March, the presentation to the Neighborhood Commission will go to the Public Safety and Finance Strateg Strategic Support Committee, which is basically council members that monitor and make suggestions to the police and fire. Um, March 19th, we plan to make a presentation to that committee, with the council members and the mayor on it. And then April, if we, if the public and the department decides to go forward, we'll present it to the city council in April. Okay, we want to make sure you know that we have limited uh, specific. Uh, occurrences we want to use this for and it's basically two things to evaluate potential explosive devices and then emergency situations where people's lives are at risk such as an active shooter or a hostage barricade uh, all flights would be approved by a command officer and would be logged and accounted for it and subject to audit and many times when we're at, at an incident we have our there's a record on the dispatch. And so say you're using a specific equipment and you would say, you know, control, we're breaking out this item. And so it gets logged on there. So when we use it, if we do use it at an incident, it'd be control, we're, we're, uh, we, we're using the UAS. And that would be marked in the, uh, in the uh, computer-aided dispatch record. And so it would be very easy to do an audit a year in audit, you can do, they can just hit two buttons and we would see how many times we use it. Internally, we would be also be marking when we use it, where we use it, and how long we use it. And that would be a record and we can audit that every year. The, be the reason why, part of that, that data would be the reason why, the location, how long do we use it, who is operating it, and who is the commanding officer that uh, approved the use. The, uh, like I said, the flights would only be used for legitimate public safety missions, training, or demonstration. Like we, like, we do canine demonstrations. We have a SWAT team use some of their equipment for demonstrations. If a community group wanted a demonstration, we would be glad to do that. Uh, suggested policy considerations. Uh, the uh, UAS would be distinctly marked. Now, I want to make this clear we would not have any of the following capabilities. There would be no weapons on this, no acoustical devices, no imagers, um, no um, identification devices, and we'll plan on doing a one-year test period. I mean, there, it might be that if we do use this, that, boy, this is really nice and we like it, or it might be this isn't what we thought it was. So that's why we want to do the year evaluation. There will be no recording or collection of data that is a real-time view, so there won't be like a digital uh, video device or anything on <coughs> any of the solution. It's just a real-time downlink that we need. Um, accounting for mission creep. Mission creep is 
you're going to use an item for a specific reason and then you say, oh, you know what, maybe we can try this and try this and now you're not using it for what you intended to. So if we want to use it for something else, we will come back to the policy committee and we will say we would like to use it for this reason. But it will not be used for any of the specific, uh, any other reason besides the two specific ones I gave. And it's all, most importantly too, it will not be flown over crowds. <coughs> the, we will follow all FAA regulations and federal and state laws when we use this. We have to obtain a uh, certificate of authorization through the FAA uh, if our direction is to move forward. The uh, pilots will have specific training on how to fly it, and it would only be flown by trained personnel, which would be members of our, our bomb unit. We'll follow all Fourth Amendment search requirements are followed, and proposed limited uses to occur during exigent circumstances to protect life. And if I could just put it in layman terms, if an officer goes to a front door and hears someone screaming for help and they're in danger, obviously it's impractical for him to get a search warrant to go in there and help that person. This is the same thing that the UAS will be used. If there's a bomb or if there's an active shooter, we, will, we will, don't need a search warrant for it because someone's life could possibly be in danger. And that's pretty much it, unless and we can go on to the questions because I know you guys have a lot of them. Thank you, Tim. I, I just wanted to point out uh, a couple of things. First off, uh, it's not our intention to use it over crowds, and that's what we specifically stated. But there might be a time when going to one of those extras and circumstances, we had to go over a group of people to get there. Um, usually not, but that's one of the considerations. The other is that the Neighborhoods Commission asked us to come up with kind of an, an executive overview of policy suggestions so that by doing that, we could have the community give us their input about what we're suggesting and say, yes, we think that's okay, or no, we don't like that, or we'd like you to change this. I'll give you one example. Some of the input that we got through email was uh, in training. Somebody had mentioned that for training purposes, um, they had concerns about where we would do the training and that that could lead to mission creep. So if we were doing training, they had concerns about that. Our thought in regard to that is, well, that makes sense. So if we're doing any kind of training, we would limit that to just city-owned types of properties where we would do those trainings. So that's the kind of input that we're looking for. That's the two-sided page that was at the front table, if you want to review that. Pretty much the same stuff that Captain Porter covered, but that's kind of our executive summary of usage, accountability, uh, privacy considerations, uh, FAA regulations, and then the timeline. Uh, if, if you want to address that specifically when we're going through. Other than that, uh, it's okay with I you. guess we're ready to take questions from the audience. Okay. Uh. My name is Bruce, and my question is, um, is the location of the liftoff at a centralized location, or do you transport it, what do you transport it in? It, it would be transported by one of the uh, bomb units vehicles to the location mm -hmm. because there's a, it only has such a uh, uh, length uh, and you have to fly it by line of sight and so obviously a central location it wouldn't work going to areas way out in the city. Do you want to walk around with the microphone? Yeah, yeah, we are. Go yeah, we're going back and forth. So thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, I got my Hi, my name is Nick. I'm just curious, as you work through your evaluation period, what type of metrics are you going to use to measure the success of this actual unit? Because you said you spend a year in a trial period. You know, how are you going to measure that at the end of the day? What are you looking at to say this was a success or this was not a success? <coughs> Again, my name is Sergeant Doug Wedge. So I have a terrible call with me. Um, from a bomb squad standpoint, it would really be a matter of uh, are we able to use it advantageously to where we can get better information, make sure that the area is safe. Um, it's primarily, we are a reactive unit. We don't go out and look for <clears throat> devices or bombs. We generally get called uh, 
by either the public or uh, another police you know unit that there's something suspicious so we would use that um, in an area like the captain said where we can't get a ground or remotely operated robot to get to that area um, I don't know if there's metrics as far as um, like a laboratory type way to gauge that. I mean, ultimately it's going to be, do we even use it? Is it appropriate to use? And when we do use it, are we increasing public safety and or safety to the bomb squad members? So if I'll touch on that a little bit too. The metrics that we're looking at, clearly there's there's really only the two types we're, we're looking at using. Um, if there are explosive devices that we want to look at, so one of the metrics is going to be how often do we use it? Because right now we don't know how often we would need to use it. Um, secondly, would be when we do use it, how long are we using it for? A metric would be have we provided more safety for our bomb technicians because they had an opportunity to not be as close to that device as they otherwise might have been. Um, when we're talking about uh, the logging for this, we're talking about the location, the flight time, who piloted it, all of those things are kind of metrics that we're looking at. And so certainly, like Captain Porter talked about, the biggest reason that we uh, want to use this device is we believe it will provide an extra <coughs> amount of safety for our officers and maybe give them a little bit of an advantage when they're dealing with these tactical incidents. So if we were to use it five or ten times, and somehow that offered some extra safety for those officers, I, I think that that would be a metric that shows us that it was a positive use and it was something that was beneficial. Yeah, I guess it was just more of the attribution. How do you know that that particular UAV is actually improving the performance of these groups and squads and those types of things? So I, don't, I don't know. And, and certainly, when we're talking about social sciences versus the natural sciences, it's always harder to set up some sort of a study because in social sciences, it's not hard and it's not easy for us to say that this plus this equals this. And so that's something that we always contend with. And I, I don't know that you can specifically measure, um, as you would in a hard science, the effectiveness. My thought, though, is that if it offers some sort of safety for my officers, then we've had a success. Um, and, and it could be that we come back and if we have complaints about it or people are unhappy about it, that might show that if there was some negativity to it. But those are all things that we need to look at. Hi, I'm Dave Truslow, and I sent over a copy of a presentation which I understand won't be presented today, but I had just a few questions. And one of them is that I wouldn't dispute the issue of the video feeds. You're talking about an open band. It's like a CB radio. Anybody can intercept it. And also jam it. There have been studies at the University of Colorado and the jamming radius is 14 miles. So <laughs> I understand what you said, but it's not supported by fact. The main concern that I have, though, is a bit different, and that is what's the cost-benefit analysis? And I understand the gentleman's point about soft science versus hard science, but in 2012, Senator Tom Coburn headed the Senate Oversight Report Committee and they describe Jones as useless and ineffective taxpayer expenditures. Now, currently, the best data that I have comes from the mayor's uh, State of the City presentation, and it showed that our response time for the San Jose Police Department is worse than two times the target. And I don't understand why public safety would warrant this kind of expense when we aren't meeting, as far as I know, our basic response time targets. In fact, we're twice as worse maybe even more so because we've lost, I believe, a lot of officers since Mayor Reed reported that in February. And I don't, so, so, so why is that this is more important than response time and some of the other pressing needs that we have? Thank you, sir. Um, I, I think that absolutely there's a lot of needs and not only the police department, but the whole city has. Um, when we're looking at a cost-benefit analysis, there's a lot of things that we spend money on that we, uh, for technology especially, that when we do have lower staffing levels, technology certainly does not replace a police officer, but it helps us in dealing with some of those issues. This device was just under $7,000, um, and that sounds like a lot of money, but in relationship to the response times and those kinds of things, it's not going to get close to what it cost me for one police officer. Um, but certainly when we're talking about a cost-benefit analysis of the safety that a $7,000 device might offer, 
for one of my officers who might be injured, um, and, and I haven't gone through a cost-benefit analysis to see exactly what that is, but I, I would submit that $7,000 is certainly worth even one time that it might protect one of my officers. Um, and so, you know, we look at different kinds of technology. We spend money not only in the police department, but I think throughout the city and throughout business, and this is where we're going into the future, that we think that technology could help us. So. Um, $7,000 is a lot of money, but I think that for the amount that we have spent, if it offered one of my bomb technicians some amount of safety, that that $7,000, in my opinion, is well spent. And I might add what the Chief said, that it has duplicate replacement parts, so that's why the cost is, is up more than if you just looked at it at a store, because the, the parts wear out and break. So we basically have enough parts for two. Thank you. In the event of an unauthorized mission creep or images being retained, what would be the penalties for those violations? So, um, like we've mentioned, our plan is to set it up so that we're recording these things and, and what's going on. If there's a violation of that policy, like any other violation of our police policy, then uh, our internal affairs unit could investigate that, and officers would be subject to the same issues if they violated other policies uh, in regard to if, if they were using it when they shouldn't be. Um, hi, my name is Mike Katz. Um, you had mentioned that it would only be used um, in uh, compliance with the Fourth Amendment. Since there isn't a whole lot of uh, litigation around the use of drones in the Fourth Amendment, what exactly does that mean? Uh, there's not a whole lot of, of uh, case law surrounding this, and so we're kind of in a place right now where it's our understanding and belief that what the captain was talking about is the two times that we're talking about would be under exigent circumstances, wherein there's not a requirement to get a search warrant. Now, I'm also aware that the California uh, legislature had originally passed some legislation that the governor vetoed talking about getting a search warrant every time. But that isn't current law. If something like that were to be current law, and I'm not saying right, wrong, or indifferent, all that I'm saying is that if that were to become law, then at that time we would comply. It's our thought now, and talking to our city attorney, we believe that in the two uses that we're currently looking at, that those would be exigent circumstances, and currently, we would not need uh, to get a warrant. However, if there is some case on point that says we need to, then we will follow that law. Uh, name's Rick. The current FAA draft procedures are requiring a certified pilot to operate drones. And what is the position of the International Chiefs of Police on the use of drones? So, uh, I don't know specifically, I think the, I can't remember, I've looked at some of the research from some different police chiefs association, I think it might have been the IACP that put out a guideline in regard to using them, so I don't think that they're against it. Um, so that's the first question, uh, I think that they do have some policy recommendations, and, and if that's the right study that I'm recalling that I was reviewing, some of those things are put in into the policy that we're looking at here. Um, the second part of your question was into FAA regulations. We know that the FAA is supposed to put out regulations in 2015. Obviously, we're not there yet. Some of those requirements that they're talking about, and actually I was talking to a reporter out in the hall about this earlier, is that that hasn't been totally determined. And so when we talk about training our pilot, our, our UAS pilots, um, we don't know exactly what that's going to be. It could be that we ask the sergeant to come up with a 40-hour training program, a 20-hour training program, where he works with uh, the person who sold this to us, a hobbyist who knows how to fly these things. That could be one aspect. Or it could be all the way to the other extreme, where the FAA requires that the people who fly these are actually pilots. But because the FAA has not defined that yet, whatever that is, we will provide some training to make sure that we're uh, flying the safe, but we will be in compliance with whatever those rules are. Uh, Sergeant Wedge, there is some FAA guidelines right now, very limited, but uh, Sergeant Wedge can discuss uh, how the FAA says this should be flew and the uh, um, limitations to it. 
So right now, it, it, you can't be above 400 feet. The reality of the situation is we don't want to be anywhere near 400 feet because you can't see what you're trying to look at. In our world, we're usually looking at a backpack, uh, something that's suspicious. Most time, it's relatively small. Uh, if we're high up in the air, we can't get a good look at what we're looking at. The whole kind of point of this is to get situational awareness to see uh, in the explosive world, the size of the package, and I don't want to get into it too much here, but the size of what you're looking at kind of gives you an idea of how bad it might be. Um, so that's one of the instances is 400 feet is the ceiling the FAA says. Uh, that's way too high for us. We don't, we don't need or want to be uh, any, any higher than that. We will not fly around airports, obviously. Um, We've all seen some of these uh, people that are doing things that are not appropriate. We would not obviously do that at all. Uh, and then also, uh, it was touched on earlier, but <clears throat> these things are very much affected by their environment. If it's a windy day, you can't fly this thing. If it's low light, no light, the one that we have, can't really see at night. Again, I don't want to get too down in the weeds, but it, 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 the more wind you have, the more battery power you use. Uh, so it's, it's get definitely, this is not an all weather military type uh, machine uh, at all. And obviously we're going to comply with uh, not only the FAA regulations, but obviously with the conditions that we're facing. And you know, I, if I could say one last thing, I, it's kind of like your toolbox. Um, everybody has a screwdriver, everybody has a hammer, but you may be fixing a light bulb and you don't need that. But if you do need that, you bring everything in your toolbox. This is just another tool in the toolbox. Hi, SK Panda with the Downtown Residents Association. Um, about a couple of months back, we encountered uh, one of the high-rise condominium complexes here <coughs> with uh, a guy who was flying drones with cameras. We perceived that he was trying to feed into the houses and, and had you know, uh, a GoPro blinking light at the ninth floor, 10th floor. Um, folks saw it very close and reported it as an incident. So there's a little bit of ambiguity as to how um, the law protects um, something like that. So my question is, have you considered how, um, how any, um, any person from the street could actually interfere with when you are trying to investigate something by flying in their own drone, which is now available um, for for buying from Best Buy, and actually GoPro is going to come out with a copter camera device, which is a ready-made, ready-to-go, cost eleven $1 hundred dollars, and it, it would be pretty comical if you are going in with your own drones, and if there are no laws to protect a common citizen to go and fly the same thing. How does you know? How does that all play into the question? Well, see, this is such a relatively new type of technology, as we move forward, and if we move forward, there's those type of situations and others we're going to have to work with and try to figure it out. Sure. But we haven't even got to that point of tr even getting close to using it or testing it how we want to use. So as we progress, then a lot of those issues will come into play, and we're just going to have to work with everyone to try to figure them out. I'm sorry I don't have any more specific, but it, you're right. I read that article, and it, it's so, so new, and all of these issues are coming up, and we're just going to have to deal with them one at a time as they come up. Do you want to get Robert? He's been waiting for a while. Robert's going to go. Uh, Robert Sandoval, Neighborhood Commissioner for District 7. My question is this. How many calls do you get per week or per month on bomb threats? You know, it, it, it very much varies. Uh, we generally run around 110 calls or so a year. Um, but there's different categories when the president comes to town, when a very important person or dignitary comes to town. So how you lump these things together, uh, if you put everything that the bomb squad does, meaning every time the truck moves, every time we do a bomb sweep, we use the bomb dog, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. Uh, actual devices, um, you could even break that down. What is a real bomb? What is suspicious? Uh, so to, 
to answer your question, um, real devices where we have real energetic material that is either nefariously put there or it is something that is dangerous yet there's no real crime to go along with it, uh, around 110 calls a year. Hi. Um, so these flight logs are going to be auditable, Sorry. auditable. Um, but will they be publicly available? And if so, over like what intervals will they be available? So we would follow any laws uh, that are applicable to public records acts releases. And so if there was a PRA and it didn't deal with tactical issues, or we didn't, <clears throat> excuse me, have a current investigation going on, we would follow those laws as far as what we would release. Okay. So if a decision is made to move forward for one year to test and evaluate it, then I might be mistaken, but I think the, the Supreme Court said the FAA cannot regulate these types of drones. And so will your decision to follow FAA guidelines uh, be voluntary? Will it be included in the policy um, if the understanding that the FAA cannot regulate these types of drones uh, is true. So I'm actually not aware of, of a Supreme Court decision that says that, um, but we will comply with what the FAA says in regard to the usage of this. So Sergeant Wedge was, was talking about, you know, not flying over 400 feet, not flying in airports. Certainly we don't want to do anything, and, and the reason the FAA has these regulations isn't so much to regulate the actual drone for many of the concerns that are out there concerning privacy. Privacy. The FAA's primary concern is about what's going on in the sky. So we want to comply with that because we don't want to endanger any, any of the airplanes or any of those kinds of issues. So yes, we would comply with what those regulations are. My name is Tommy, and it seemed, I seem to have heard two different things. One saying no retention of video, and I heard someone else say we will retain the video, but I don't, don't know the exact phrase. I'm just curious which it is, and also uh, would, would there be any forensic use of that video, and what kind of period of time would it be retained, if that's the case? No, we are not going to use video. We're retain. We're, I mean, obviously we'll have a live feed, but we're not going to record anything. Is there a reason for that? Well, right now we just want to make it simple because, you know, we, we haven't really used it yet. And then you're talking about another piece of equipment we'll have to purchase, and we don't really see a need for that right now. If we did in the future, then we would come back to the commission and uh, try to get it approved, but we're not going to even experiment with that. I think it was just kind of follow up on, on the retention of the video thing. So, I mean, so how are you going to evaluate performance right. with, for example, in a, in a bomb threat situation or some other use of the drone if you're not retaining the video for right. some sort of evaluation purposes? So the part, uh, like the captain talked about, part of the reason that we're not recording right now is we know that there's a lot of concern surrounding us recording things. So in our thought, as we go through this one-year policy uh, and uh, one-year um, test period, that we don't need to record. Right now, we don't record using the other robots when we're dealing with bomb issues. Um, so all that this is is a downlink that gives us eyes onto that device or onto that tactical situation so that we can see what's going on. So uh, we don't feel that there's a need uh, to record because we're looking at it on the screen right now as it happens so that the bomb technicians can make their determination as to what they need to do, uh, or a tactical commander could make their decisions uh, as to what they need to do based on that real-time view. That's almost like saying an NFL team or a sports team or something that plays a game, then they don't retain video at all to ever go back and evaluate performance. I mean, obviously teams keep this stuff to be able to kind of go back and actually evaluate we don't the performance of team members rather than just saying, well, it was just that happened that day, we caught what we could catch during the, the moment, and now it's no longer available. I mean, it would make sense that you probably would want to retain it, but 
Certainly. Uh, the, there's a whole lot of issues also that surround keeping this stuff in. And sometimes, while it, it might make sense to keep some of these things, we also have to make decisions about that. And, and of course, could that be helpful? Yes. Um, but at the same time, then we have to store these things as a government agency, unlike the NFL. Uh, there are specific policies that we have to have with retention, many of the privacy concerns in retention. Um, we have to pay money to have more technology that allows us in servers to keep all of that stuff. And so certainly when the bomb techs go out and deal with these things, they talk about things that went well, things that didn't go well, and they talk about incidents that happened at other places. So yes, there could be a use, uh, I'm not going to argue that point, but we think that at this point it's better to not retain those things because of many of the privacy concerns that there are and because of the technology reasons and the extra costs that we go. My name is Charlotte Casey, and uh, I'm with the San Jose Peace and Justice Center. I was carrying this sign at a rally that we held in October, with concerns about the drones. And since that time, we gathered over 1,600 signatures on a petition to keep the gr drone on the ground, to ground the drone. And I handed over that petition to you at the last meeting. So my question is, uh, we appreciate that you've gone through this process, unlike Alameda County, which seemed to do an end run around the process. Uh, this is great that you're getting community input. My question is, will there be uh, a decision based on if there's so much concerns about the loss of our privacy from the community, is there an option that you won't advocate for use of the drone? That you'll simply say, no, we've heard from the community, and this is not an option. We're going to send it back. So if you're asking me from the police perspective, uh, no. I am advocating that I think that this would be a good tool for the simple reason that I think that it offers a level of protection for my officers. Uh, but I'm not the one who's going to make this decision. That's why we're bringing it here. It will be the policy makers that when it goes to the neighborhood <coughs> commission, they will make a recommendation to the public safety uh, committee, which will then make a recommendation to the policy makers in the city council. And that's who will make the ultimate decision. And I, I think that they'll take much of the input that's been gathered throughout. Is this a drone capable of autonomous flight, or does it need a pilot at all times? And is there a maintenance schedule to make sure that these things don't fall out of the sky? It needs someone to give, give it input and, and fly it. Um, if you let go of the controls, it will stop and hover. And if you don't give it input for a certain period of time, it it decides, okay, I, I'm going to land because something's not right. And so it slowly decelerates and just lands on its own. Maintenance? Uh, maintenance, um, there's not a whole lot of maintenance to it. Obviously, we need to make sure that, you know, we do a pre-flight check like you would do. batteries. Yeah, batteries, that's a very good point. We need batteries. Um, um, like I said earlier, that you know, the flight time on this is not long. I mean, on a good day, it is like maybe 10, 15 minutes mm -hmm. tops. Uh, technology with batteries and the weight has not caught up with, uh, you know, we have to, just like the electric cars, they're slowly getting better and getting better and getting better. <clears throat> Hi, Tessa D'Arcangelo. I'm a privacy and racial justice advocate with the ACLU of Northern California. And my question in relation to your suggested policy under privacy and other concerns, you say um, the UAS would not be used outside of the policy guidelines developed unless the SJPD went back before elected officials. So my question is, what is that process? Does that process look similar to the one that you're going through now, or is it more like the one that you went through about nine, 12 months ago that landed us where we are today? So I think that if we wanted to change those, we would probably make a report to the uh, Public Safety Committee and determine from there what their direction would be. Would that direction to come back be to come back to the Neighborhoods Commission and discuss what we're talking about for expanding those, or would they take it uh, and make a determination there? So that would be, uh, I think, how we would proceed would be to go back before the Public Safety uh, Commission Committee. Several times, uh, 
uh, I don't can't remember how many times, but the, uh, the captain has talked about his safety. Well, what I'm concerned about is the public safety, which I don't believe has been mentioned, or is it supposed that we're supposed to assume that if he feels safe, then we should feel safe? I, now again, I'm safe. Oh, as I said, I keep hearing your safety and your staff. So I think that this offers us an opportunity for the bomb technician to not have to go close to that. So that's why I keep talking about the safety of the officer, because it's the officer who's going to get close to that, not the general public. Obviously, after we've controlled that area and we've evacuated the area, and now we have to get close to it to look at it. Um, I think that the public safety aspect of this is that we're having the officers go to that area to make that explosive device safe, however they might do that. So that would be the first circumstance, and I don't know that that really specifically relates um, for the use of this for the public safety in, in that case. And in the second, when we're talking about a tactical incident, tactical incident wherein we have uh, an active shooter or a hostage barricade, certainly we have somebody who's actively trying to harm the community, and that would lead to public safety because now we can use it perhaps, and, and I don't know because we haven't used it, but if we have an active shooter situation, and, and that is where somebody is, is going through a school or going through a movie theater or going somewhere else where they're actively shooting at people, in those situations, unlike the movies where the movie always knows exactly where that active shooter is, we don't. When we get there, there's oftentimes much confusion about where that person is. And that's one of our biggest issues is trying to locate where that person is. So if we had this device, it might help us in addition to the other officers that are trying to find this person. It, it might offer us another opportunity to locate them. And in that case, once we do locate the him, uh, then we can deal with that situation. And I think certainly that helps public safety. So in a general scheme, I think all of this is for all public safety in that we're trying to alleviate potential explosive devices as well as any of these tactical situations that, that we're talking about. My question is, um, since we're already limited on personnel in the police department, and we're already using um, robots with cameras, will this require a separate person to run the um, drone? And um, will the drone and the robot be sharing the same frequencies for the controls and video? So the first, the first question, uh, when the bomb squad responds to a call, uh, there's generally a minimum of two, that's a federal standard from uh, the FBI, um, as many as four, and if it gets uh, to where we need more manpower, we'll call more people. So there would already be enough people to operate the uh, UAS if we needed to do that. <clears throat> I want to say again that you know this is not it's it's another tool in the tool chest. It is not the panacea. Uh, you know if you're going to uh, deal with a suspicious package that you can get a ground robot to, you would do that. Um, this is this is uh, we're not going to use this all the time. Um, so it, there would be a there would be enough manpower to do this. Uh, obviously, we're in the very beginning stages of this. Um, I guess I would use maybe like a driver's license analogy to use some common sense. Just because you got your driver's license doesn't mean that you're a great driver. You need to go out and practice. And that's kind of where we're at on this whole thing is uh, we need to practice. The gentleman has already pointed out that the information coming from the drone and transmitting the drone could be picked up by uh, anyone with a broadband radio collector. Has there been any thought to, uh, at, this, at the drone itself, to scramble the signals coming down to be received? So our bomb robots. Uh, like everything else evolves, uh, I, I've been in, in this business for a long time. Uh, we do use encrypted frequencies. 
Uh, we get a license from the FCC for certain uh, frequencies. Uh, I'm not going to go into what those freaks are, obviously, but uh, this one, it, it, we do not. Uh, we purposely did not want to get something that was militaristic, <coughs> that was anything different. We, it's our first step. We didn't want to reach out and, you know, when you start talking about Coftum radios, uh, frequencies, scaling frequencies, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars just for the radio alone. And we have those on our ground operated robots. Uh, we purposely steered away from that. We are trying to just, we are in the, we are literally, I think, forward thinking. We want to do this transparently. Uh, we, want to, we want to share this with you, but we purposely did not overreach to try to get something uh, that is uh, of a much greater scale. Hi, I'm Nick Lovosky from District 10 uh, Council, uh, um, Mission Member. Uh, appreciate Deputy San Jose Police coming here uh, so quickly after our meeting just a few weeks ago. The response has been outstanding, quite frankly, to come back with a policy, suggested policy, that uh, I think is looking common sense. Now, uh, beyond that, I think we're, we're all participating in a really important process here. The use of technology, whether it's drones or other types of select technology, but especially for policing purposes, is inevitable. Uh, there are going to be cities, whether, it's not, whether or not San Jose decides to go through with this or not, we're uh, showing the template for how it's done. We go through a public process, we, we hear from the experts of what is needed for policing. The decision is made uh, not just by the policing organization, but by city council with the uh, condo and the neighborhoods commission. This is how it should be done. And whatever the decision ends up falling, it'll be a well thought uh, through decision. And I heard from one of my colleagues that uh, Alameda County didn't use that process. Well, I'm just very proud to be a part of the process that we are in fact doing that here. So thank you everyone for uh, for coming back so quickly after a very short period of time with uh, the next uh, uh, presentation, and we'll look forward to seeing the other follow-on uh, public lead meetings as well. Thank you. So co coincidentally, uh, my comments were going to be along the same lines, so I want to start a, a neighborhoods commissioner for District 5, um, and uh, I'm currently doing a survey so that people can chime in because our charge as neighbors commissioners are to get community input. And uh, I think that regardless of where this decision will end up, what is good is that this process is occurring in San Jose. Uh, obviously, I love San Jose. Uh, I consider us the leader in the Bay Area. And I, I think that our police department is showing leadership by exploring this, by not saying we're going to use it and this is what we're going to do, but this could be a useful tool and we need to figure out if it is, uh, and we need to engage everybody. Uh, and as Nick said, uh, I think that there's a potential for uh, a great decision, whatever it is, that could be modeled by other cities, uh, not just in California, but the U.S. And so I think it's good that we're having this discussion uh, with the understanding that there are differing opinions, uh, and that's just my comment. Hi, Richard Kalanda. I just wanted to put it out there because I think the process is actually flawed because the drone was purchased before there was any input. And I understand that maybe there were some errors within the department, but really the input we're having now should have occurred before the purchase occurred. And I don't understand why that didn't happen, and I think that's really a problem with the process. Don O'Connell. I was curious about when the final decision will be made. It looks according to the suggested timeline it might be around June of next year. Yes, so right now that is the, the tentative schedule would be that we would do two more uh, community outreach meetings and uh, that would put us into April when we would do a presentation to the City Council, but we're, that's just a general guideline. I mean, it could be that uh, perhaps there's a thought that we need more community outreach, and if that's the case, then we're, we're willing to do that as well. So that's kind of the, the general schedule as to what we're looking at now. We kind of came up with that because when we went before the Neighborhoods Commission, one of their questions was, what do you see as a timeline for this? So that's kind of a, where we are right now. 
Eski Panda again with the Downtown Residents Association. I, I, I want to stress that, you know, irrespective of what's happened in the past, this is really, really good, okay? What we are doing is showing a great model, and I appreciate what you guys are doing. And I also want to let everybody know that the response from the cops during our drone crisis was fabulous. We had personal folks coming in. A great shout out to Captain Tony Cherboro. Personally came down, talked to us, and we felt good. We knew there were laws that are ambiguous, so we're all gonna have to work towards it. Um, I'll follow up with a question though. I heard um, that the limitation of the drone is 10 to 15 feet um, in terms of flying and what you're trying to do to hover over the back. What happens for a high rise? You know, we've got tall buildings coming up everywhere in San Jose. So would you, uh, does that, does the drone usage get limited in, in cases of a bomb package in the high rise or have you thought about it? Okay. Maybe I misspoke. Uh, 10 to 15 minutes flight time, not, not altitude. Um, Maybe I got that wrong, I apologize. Um, <clears throat> the drone can, uh, UAS, uh, it can be used, it, it's really situational, uh, case by case basis is what it boils down to. Um, we know, uh, not by utilizing the one we have, but we know by just looking at YouTube that most commercial high rise buildings have a reflective uh, film in the window to keep the heat down. And really, a lot of times, uh, in those situations, you end up looking in the mirror. You can't look inside something because uh, it's commercially made glass. And, and, and so and having said that, uh, we, we may attempt to utilize that. Um, I don't know until we have that scenario kind of playing out. We could kind of what if a lot of this to forever. Uh, but we would have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. But a lot of times, you can't look inside uh, a window. Christina Branch, uh, Vice President of Silicon Valley on Republicans. And I, my question surrounds the uh, ability for technology to change over time, the progression of technology. And <clears throat> excuse me, as uh, you have stated, a lot of concerns are surrounding the capabilities of the technology on your drone. Uh, but as those capabilities improve, as the technology available for those capabilities improve, are you willing to revisit this and have a public discussion about new capabilities for future drones? Yes, like we said, uh, when we were talking about mission creep or changing the policies and procedures, we would definitely come back and the public would be involved in that. If there was something new, we wanted to change something, add or take away, we definitely would do the same process or something similar. Uh, my name is Mrs. Clark. Um, first of all, I want to let you know, as law enforcement officers, we appreciate what you do. We, honestly, you see a bunch of stuff on the news now, we are thankful. Um, the, but one thing that I want to bring up, and I'm a little late because we couldn't find the entrance here, um, is it's saying that this is the first step. So, some of us who are concerned about this, you know, like the Patriot Act is going to be all safe and we're, you know, this and that, and now all of a sudden we're being you know, looked at very seriously, you know, at the airports, this, this whole other discussion. I want to know if these drones, as you said, it's just the first step, what is the second step and, and onward, can these be used against the population that are not planting bombs? Are they, is this funding itself, are you going to use this for like tickets, law, you know, uh, traffic control? Is it a source of revenue, basically? Are you going to like, fly over people who grow pot and all of a sudden they're being, you know, you're finding out things that you weren't necessarily purchasing these for and I'm, because I'm late, I don't know, is this a done deal already and we're just having a, a community conversation? Those are my questions. No, actually, as the process, it says plan moving forward, you can see the different steps that we're taking with the city and the community as far as, as authorizing this, if, if it is. But no, we listed two specific examples basically public safety, life endangerment, and a sus uh, suspicious package. We don't plan on using, we are not going to use this for any type of surveillance, anything that you just mentioned. What is step number two? Well, no, the, as far as the community meetings and then presentation to this neighborhood uh, uh, commission, and then the next commission will say, decide to 
maybe not move forward or move forward. And if it moves forward, it goes to another city council public safety commission, and then they'll decide to bring it back. If they, yes or no, they'll bring it back to council, and then council will be the ultimate authority that will say yes or no. There are handouts over there at the okay. desk as well that help walk you through the process. I'm Dave Noel at Erickson Neighborhood Association. You mentioned you have spare parts. I'm wondering if that includes batteries, so are you able to um, get, you know, extend the, the, the time on this by swapping batteries and how long does it take to recharge to use it again for another day? We do have spare batteries. Um, <laughs> how long it takes to recharge is how depleted your battery is. I mean, if you are on E empty, uh, you know, it takes uh, over an hour to charge these things. Um, <clears throat> so yes, we have spare batteries. Um, again, the, it's the weight of the battery itself. There was some, for people that know a little bit about electricity, we thought about putting them in uh, parallel, which increases your power or your staying time. But that's not going to work with this because we are putting more weight on on the UAS and more weight. So it's, it's, there's, no, there's no benefit to putting more batteries in this thing because it just makes it way more and your flight time stays relatively the same. Can you just swap it out to charge batteries? I'm sorry? Can you just swap batteries? Well, you got to bring it back to you and land it. Uh, so it, it, you know, yes, you can swap them out, certainly, you know, but it takes some time. Calling from uh, Pleasant Knoll, when the police choppers are flying, you can call 311 and find out pretty much what's going on. Is that going to be the case with this if, if it goes into use? Well, if you suspect you hear this thing flying overhead, you can call and say, yes, it's in use and for the following purpose. If, if yes, if, if you see this being flown, hopefully you're not, you won't see it because it's a dangerous situation. And, but it, yes, you could call dispatch. And if, it, and if we are using it, like Air 2, they will say yes. But sometimes uh, we've already been mistaken by other people's drones thinking it was ours, and obviously it, it was not. But yes, that's something that you can find out as a citizen. You mentioned the public commission and you mentioned the neighborhood commission and just to make it uh, nice and official, does that mean that the public will be a part of this process and will all be a part of this process? Because I'm a little uh, hurt by some of the things that you said. I feel that you're not telling us the truth and I feel that uh, you need to be very honest with us. And I think, you know, people are going to try to be nice about this, but you're, you've been a little bit insulting. I think it's important to, to offer real, genuine dialogue, and I hope that, uh, to get back to my question, is the neighborhood group and the uh, public policy group or public security or something, are those going to be publicly invited? Is the public going to be invited to those things so we can all be step by step a part of this, basically, and we can all learn together how to do this you know, so publicly? Thank you, sir. Yes, the uh, Neighborhoods Commission is a, a public body that people can go to and attend and speak at. It's the same with the Public Safety uh, Committee. Um, and then certainly at City Council, people would have time to talk to all of these issues. Public Safety Committee is part of the City Council. Now, the Public Safety, the, the uh, Public Safety, Finance, and Strategic Support Committee is a subset of the City Council. Some of the council members get together beforehand and then bring it before the entire City Council. And the Neighborhoods Commission meets here monthly, except December and July, and that's open to the public. I would believe so, yes. The Public Safety Committee, yes, that's open to the public as well. And that, that's publicly messaged, um, and they have, just, just like here, um, that there's a, a point at which in, in all of these uh, committee or council meetings that the public can speak to what that agenda item is. Uh, I might add that if you can attend, you can go onto the city's website, you can usually watch these live, or they archive them. So if you missed them or somebody said something, you can research that, and then maybe bring that information or whatever your thought was to the next process. 
Yeah, you can watch all the meetings at civic, uh, San Jose CA.gov slash Civic Center TV, and then there are also archived meetings there as well if you're unable to watch it live. You can watch it afterwards. <laughs> Yeah, this, is, this is not being built right now. I'm Marilyn Rogers with VP Community Association, which is in South San Jose, and some of my questions have already been answered because I was thinking about public education, and again, I want to thank you all for doing this. First, the Neighborhoods Commission for bringing this forward for everyone and for your presentations. I think it's been extremely helpful. A lot of my questions and concerns, and, and my community I represent, Certainly you've answered those concerns, at least for this period of time. As we know what technology is going to continue to move forward, I'm very proud of what you've done in terms of starting a model. And I want to second those comments about this model. It's not only helpful for us, but I think it can be used by other communities across the country. So I want this to continue. So as the technology changes, you want to upgrade, I don't think people will have a concern if you continue to do this kind of education. And I was going to ask, is this being... It taped so it can be replayed for people who aren't here or for the folks who had to come in late and didn't hear the presentation originally. I think that would be extremely helpful. Second part of this is, I know you're going forward with more community meetings into January and February. My question is, because I'm um, president of a large community association, we have monthly meetings. Um, will folks be available to come out and in smaller groups do this kind of presentation? I'm hoping you'll say yes. <laughs> So to the, to the first question, is this uh, being recorded? There's an audio recording of the Neighborhoods Commission's meetings. Um, but I, I asked Ernest, who kind of runs this uh, this week when we were preparing for this, that is not something that's currently on the website, but if you wanted a copy of the um, audio portion, then Ernest could certainly get that for you. All of the other committee meetings, um, the public safety committee meeting, those are actually video, and those are the ones that you can get online. In regard to the to the meetings, certainly um, we have our, our officers and, and supervisors that go out to various community meetings. Um, you know, and, and I appreciate all the input that, that we give them both negative and positive, because certainly this is a learning experience for us. And I'm glad that we've had this opportunity because it helps us understand how to do this uh, in a way that uh, involves everybody. So in saying that, we, we kind of really understand what's going on with this UAS. Uh, we're going to educate our officers and command staff, but if they were to come to the smaller meetings, they <coughs> don't have this up-to-date information that perhaps, as we go through this, we'll certainly educate them. Um, but they, as far as doing other <coughs> outreach, um, we're probably going to have at least two more meetings, and then we'll kind of get a barometer for where we are. Do you have a follow-up question? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, rather than maybe the small meetings, but do it maybe by council districts, that would be ten meetings if people ask for them. And then you're dealing more with a specific area, I think is what I was more concerned about. Because, you know, we've got ten council districts. That's ten large cities, actually. If we look at 100,000 population in each one. So if you could do those maybe, in, or ask the council members if they would like to help sponsor one of your districts. Well, um, the two meetings we're mentioning on here, Ernest is trying to put them in an area that they're closer to the districts. So, you know, we're probably not each district, but geographically it will be an area that it's easy to get to for, for the outlying districts. And again, I mean, if we decide or if we go through this that we need more meetings, and certainly we can do that. Ernest, did you want to speak to that? Yes. Um, in the initial planning, we decided that uh, we'd have the Neighborhoods Commission meeting that um, we had about 50 or 60 people that attended that one. I plan for, uh, for 80 chairs out there today. Uh, the commissioners have a separate count. We probably had 100 people run through here. Um, in January, and I think we're playing around with the date of mid-January, uh, more than likely we're going to, um, once I confirm it, and, uh, uh, we'll be sending a notice out the same way that we've done this. Uh, trying to find a, a location that is uh, close to a variety of different council districts. Uh, at this point, um, we're planning on having something in mid-January, more than likely at the Bathroom Library. Uh, that's in District 6, it'll be it's close to District 1, um, easy enough for District 10 and other District 9 folks to access that, and it's got a, a large community room. After that, we're uh, planning and um, because we have some new council members, we, we need to kind of discuss uh, District 5, District 7, 
uh, potentially District 4, and those are all grouped together. Uh, I understand the desire to have uh, one in each council district. Uh, uh, we certainly have a model for that, uh, but it is also uh, an enormous amount of, uh, of work to have it. Um, part of what, um, in the strategy of trying to uh, uh, group it centrally so that we can hit uh, two or three or four council districts, is exactly um, what the Chief is talking about, to try to reach out to as many folks as we can as we work through this model. And, um, and I think in this case, um, the model seems to be effective. Uh, it's gathering quite a bit of folks uh, to uh, attend this first time. And I think that the strategy is, um, as the Chief mentioned earlier, if we need more community meetings beyond the four that we have scheduled, uh, we, we may end up having some more. Uh, so nothing set in stone yet. Uh, but I think as, as we go to each different meeting, we learn more as we move forward. And we'll see how much uh, comment and discussion we have. If I may add, we'll also continue to share information on the City of San Jose website. If you go into sanjoseca.gov slash UAS, and also the police department has information posted as well. Uh, some of this will include the PowerPoint presentation that you've seen today. So be sure to check that out. But we'll continue to keep you informed online as well as the process proceeds. Um, I tried to find a cost justification for this for police purposes. I really did, and I couldn't find any. But I did find that using it for code enforcement actually has a very distinct cost benefit uh, for the community. Now, my question is, will the police department make this technology available to other city departments? I heard that it won't be used to uh, look for pot or something like that. But that's not to say another department could be using it for other purposes. That's one question. My second question, and last, is what is the total cost of ownership? The $7,000 capital expense is typically a drop in a bucket. You have training, you have other costs that go into this. What is the total cost of ownership for the technology? So in, in regard to the question of having other departments use it, when, when I went before the Neighborhoods Commission, uh, we talked about other positive uses, uh, one being search and rescue. Um, we had an example where there was a car down a ravine and we were having a hard time finding it. Um, uh, another was that we know up in Napa after the earthquake that uh, at UAS was used to look at the structural viability of buildings to make sure that people could go into them. So those are some of the things that we talked about. We purposely have not included that in our suggested policies for several reasons. One, we want to do this pilot and see if it's beneficial for the police department. But two, um, because of all the things that we've talked about with the training and those kinds of things, we would not want to take our uh, UAS and give it to the other department and say, okay, here you go, now you can fly it and do what you need to do with it. Most likely, we would need our trained personnel to go and do that. We've had a lot of discussion about some of the staffing issues that we're facing, and that would probably be limited for us. Um, in, in regard to the question of the, the total cost of ownership, we talked about the $7,000 to buy the device. And then there's a question of training and those kinds of things. We've gone through uh, different uh, areas in which we might need to train. If the FAA has a requirement that the person has to be an actual pilot, clearly that's a lot of training. If they don't have that requirement, certainly we're going to do training so that we make sure that our people are safe with training. That How long is that? Would that be... 20 hours, would it be 40 hours? We're not sure yet, but it would not require additional people because we're going to use the same people, the bomb technicians, that we use to do other things when they're dealing with these kinds of situations. So it's not like we're going to hire new people just to deal with this. It would be a collateral duty for those same bomb technicians. Question on this um, hello, I'm a communication student at San Jose State. I was wondering if you guys could clarify something. If, let's say, there is a bomb threat at a school and the drone helps you identify where the bomb is, how will that directly protect one of your officers? Because you still have to go in there and protect public safety as your job is. So um, I don't understand how will that help you protect the lives of an officer. Well, let me, let me start by saying that the, the UAS does not go out and look for anything specific. If we were going to deploy that, it would be the same guards as we do with a ground-operated remote vehicle, which basically means we have a 
thing that is suspicious and or dangerous. Uh, so we don't use it to just look for things. We, we want to look at a specific thing. We want to look at the area around that thing. Um, and, and yes, sometimes we can do everything we need to do with a robot, believe it or not. Um, Sometimes we cannot. Sometimes the robot is not uh, has the, doesn't have the dexterity that a human does. So there's times where um, it, we will still have to put a human being uh, on that device. Well, no, I said if there is a bomb threat. So you know there is a bomb threat somewhere, then you need to spice where it is, identify where it is. You say it will help you to see where it's at in the building, but how will it help from then on? What procedure will you take to help one of your officers? Well. If we can, if we, there's a saying in our world called start remote, stay remote. And if we can start remotely and stay remotely with any means, whether that is taking a rope and pulling something out of a building and we are at a distance, uh, we will do that. So again, it's tough to, to say exactly in a scenario what we would use this for without having the scenario actually happening. But one of the things that we also do, if you think about it, is if we, go to your business or your school, to us as bomb technicians, everything's suspicious because we're not familiar with that area. So one of the first things that we do is we ask people to themselves identify what is and what is not normal here. So we don't really use robots or anything else to search for that. <coughs> Usually we have that target already. Hi, Desiree Berrigan, Commissioner for District 3. Has there been any thought to the return policy if the drone, the drone is not granted to uh, We have discussed some of that, and uh, if we needed to return it, at, at this point, we don't think that the group that we bought it from is going to say, you know, sure, here, here's, uh, we will take it uh, for a return. So um, at this point, if we did decide not to use it, um, we've considered, you know, seeing if maybe they would give us some of the money back. We've also considered perhaps uh, if another agency wanted it because we decided it wasn't something that we want to use in our community, would we be able to give it to another community um, or to another organization? It might not even be law enforcement. It might go to somebody's talk about uh, you know, some of the search and rescue groups or something like that. So we've thought about that, though we haven't really uh, gone too far into that uh, until we determine if it's going to be something that we're going to use in our community. Hi, Raj Jaya, Community Advisory Board uh, with the Sounds of Police Farmers Chief uh, and also Silicon Valley Diva. Uh, my question is around the decision making on how and if you get to step two, meaning it gets discussed with, with council, public safety. So my understanding is this stage is the gathering of community input. And based on the findings of these dialogues, you will make a determination on whether it moves forward to step two. So while I appreciate and uh, these meetings and the fact that people came out here on a Saturday morning, um, and there's a couple others scheduled, my, my question is, when it actually comes to decision-making time, how do you define if it's past the test to move forward, or if there's sufficient public concern or critique um, to then kill this process entirely and, and put this, this device behind us. I say that from the perspective of, of the larger attempt of trying to build community police trust in a very tenuous time, not just here in San Jose, but nationally. Given the discussions that are, have come out of Ferguson, New York, Oakland, it seems almost tone deaf to be talking about equipping officers with a potentially contentious a piece of equipment given this moment. Um, and there's already been large critique and criticism. There's been a public demonstration right outside this building. So how do you know? What, what, what are you going to use as the measuring stick to say there's sufficient concern um, by groups that have already publicly acknowledged that they don't want this thing? Uh, good morning, Raj. Thank you. Um, what I would say is we're not the ones who are going to make that decision. It's going to be the Neighborhoods Commission to begin with is going to give a recommendation to the Public Safety Committee and the Public Safety Committee will give a recommendation to the City Council, and the City Council will ultimately decide that. Um, we're doing things so that we're taking this information in. Um, we've developed a policy based uh, on some of the uh, best standards. 
We know that the uh, ACLU actually had a report in 2011 that talked about this. Some of the language that we have used it has come right out of that. Somebody asked about the uh, IACP, the International Association of Chiefs of Police. They have a best practices policy. So we've looked at all of those things um, to make sure that if it is decided by the city council that we move this forward, that um, we're doing it in a way that others believe is okay. So how do we get that barometer? That's a question that I've asked as well. So what we're doing is we're gonna compile this information like we would anything else. We'll create a uh, staff report to the council talking about the different things that we've heard out there. And ultimately, it will be the council uh, who I'm sure hears from their neighborhood commissioners and others that will make that decision. So I'm not trying to be challenging, but are you saying that the police department does not have any discretion then on whether this policy goes forward or not? Well, I, I don't know uh, if it's discretion, but certainly we are going to abide by, in, in this specific case, as in all, what the city council's direction is. And, and ultimately, that is, Yes, we think it's something that we want you to go forward with, or no, it's not something we want you to go forward with. So I'm Juan Estrada, District uh, Com uh, Neighborhoods Commissioner for District 5, and uh, just three things. One is uh, the Neighborhoods Commission it consists of two commissioners per council district, and uh, we will be holding a meeting, and if the current timeline holds, uh, that would be March 11th when we will issue a recommendation. I assume we will make the decision in, regarding a recommendation in February. Again, that's if the timeline holds, but whether it holds or not, at some point we will issue a recommendation. And what I want to assure you of is the Neighborhoods Commission will make sure that the public is notified of the meeting where the Neighborhoods Commission will discuss this topic and come to a decision regarding the recommendation that we'll make. Uh, two other things, one is, um, uh, as I said, uh, as a as a neighbors commissioner, uh, I launched the survey. There have been about 400 responses so far. The results of the survey will not be provided uh, to other parties until uh, they are provided to the neighbors commission uh, just a couple of weeks prior to when we will make a recommendation or a decision re regarding a recommendation. The purpose of that is to not skew the results. Uh, and so it looks like that would be sometime in early February. Uh, my expectation is there will be at least 800 responses by then. Uh, hopefully more, the more engaged the community, the better. Uh, and the last thing is that my fellow commissioner from District 3, Pete Colstead, is recording this meeting. His camera is right here. And we will post the video, and it will be available, uh, obviously, citywide and worldwide, if you wanted to tune in. But, uh, anybody that you want to, you can share the link once we provide it. I expect that that video will be available by tomorrow evening, uh, and uh, we will send uh, an email with a link, and you can share it uh, as widely as you'd like. Um, that's it. So um, you said that the lifespan was 10 to 15 minutes for the drone, um, and my question is if there's a life-threatening package and it takes you longer than 10 to 15 minutes every single time to find it or to discover where it's located, is it possible for you to get a longer life battery for it or do you have to buy a new $7,000 drone each time? What it's used for really is, is situational awareness. Uh, one of the big things is how big is the item we're looking at. That tells us potentially how much explosives could be there. It tells us how big our evacuation zone, and this is, you know, we do it with half. Um, but basically, in about 10 to 15 minutes, to gain information about something, figure out how we can access it, we are getting what we need in that time frame. Certainly, we'd like to have it up longer, but that actually may be enough time for us to figure out what we need to do. Uh, you, know, there's, you start at step one, where is it, what is it, how do we get there, how big is it, uh, can we get a robot in there? Um, so it's doing a lot of work in that 10 or 15 minutes. Um, changing batteries, yeah, at, at a certain point we're going to see, it starts to tell us, hey, I need to land, I'm out of energy, I'm, I need new batteries. We would bring it back. We could swap those out, put it back up back up if we needed to. Um, 
and then you mentioned, do I need to buy or do we need to buy a new uh, UAV? No, I think we, we just give it fresh batteries if we need more than 15 minutes. Um, my question is, uh, are you going to notify the public when you're going to fly this thing, like for practice? Um, you know, that would be really nice. Maybe we could watch for it or see. I assume that this thing makes enough noise that we can hear it. Um, and also, um, one thing that came across my mind was that, say if you're using it to chase somebody that's like maybe jumping fences, and he decides that he's going to try and take it out by shooting at it. Uh, then we've got errant bullets flying around in the air that are going to come down someplace, which is a real concern. So, I mean, could this thing possibly create more problems uh, as a result? Well, uh, go ahead. No, I'm going to let the chief and the captain do the policy thing, and I, I can talk about what it does. Well, basically, as far as practicing or, or training with it, we plan to do it on city property only. We're not going to go out in the neighborhoods and do it. Um, and as far as, I can't say there won't be a situation, we might have an active shooter, and if that person is running and we can't see him, or we don't have it locked down, there might be a slim possibility that we would use it for that. But I think our two examples of suspicious package and having a barricaded suspect are spe specific enough that I don't see it being used for those other purposes. Question on this side. Hi, I'm Alberto Rodriguez with the Community Leadership Activism Club at San Jose City. And I got a question. How would a person be able to distinguish a police drone from uh, someone else's drone that could be spying on somebody? And if you can't distinguish it, can the person take action? I know it runs parallel to her question, but I'm just having, um, I'm just curious about that. Let's say, you know, a person doesn't know if it's a police drone or not. Can he take action against it or... Um, you know, we have to notify the police, and if he does, will he face repercussions because of his actions? So, you're right, there's been two questions about that, about other drones, not specifically the police department drones, so let me address that first. Um, there's, there's not a lot of regulation around drones right now, so to that other drone that's out there flying around, that's not something that we can enforce right now. Um, and you know, determining or deciding whether or not uh, the FAA is going to have some sort of guidelines towards that. I know there was a case recently in the courts um, where something was talked about that, but it's not something right now that local law enforcement would take action against that person because we don't have local or state laws about the drone. So that's the first part of the question. The second part uh, that, that you started with was in regard to how can you tell this drone uh, differently from somebody else's drone. And we're trying to figure out how we can identify it. We will figure out how we can differentiate it from other um, UASs. The issue is that there's a weight capacity to this thing. So we're toying with, okay, do we spray it a certain color? Do we put tape on it that says police? How exactly do we do that? So it will be designated so that people can tell that it's different from uh, somebody else's UAS, but we haven't figured out exactly how we're going to I'd like to know where you are in the process of obtaining the Certificate of Authorization, the COA. Have you submitted anything to the FAA for your two-use case scenario? We have not, because we are going to wait and see what the policy direction is. If the policy direction is that we move forward, then we would go through that process. We have done investigation into that and um, looked at how we would get that, and it is somewhat of an involved process, and so that's why we, we didn't want to go through that process until we had the uh, the people telling us or the, the policy direction that this is where we are going to go. Hi, I guess they don't maybe have as much a question for you at this point as maybe some of the district representatives that are here. Um, it's more about this whole process, and I'm just curious because you had mentioned you're sending out surveys to the community. I just wanted to get a better sense of what the districts are doing, really, to sort of elicit responses from their communities to understand what the sentiment is about that and you know what percentage of response do you need for you to make a recommendation I mean, you said something like you sent out 500 surveys or something you got 500 responses to 500 one, one survey 500 responses so so i know it's reached so at least 6,000 people if you're doing a similar are you creating similar forms for people to discuss this thing like recording 
petitions of what people feel like maybe can speak a little bit about that? Well, we're trying to get as much community input as we can. Uh, we send out information. I personally have sent out emails to 2,000 people and sent out to another several hundred people that send out to their neighborhood associations. So everybody in my neighborhood gets it sent out. The different commissioners in the different districts are following a similar process. I hope you are mailing out to your districts. Uh, Juan has mailed out a survey that he sent out to sharing it for everybody that is asking anybody that's interested. What is the website for the survey? Do you want it's to share? SanJoseUnited.net. And yeah. So the, the survey is available at SanJoseUnited.net. The survey was built uh, using information from the previous Neighborhoods Commission meeting. And what it includes is two questions regarding the specific uses that at the time where uh, the police department mentioned as possibilities, I know that now they've included them as uh, what uh, they would uh, be seeking uh, if they decided to seek the use. And it also includes two questions that came out, came from the public regarding uses that should be prohibited. Uh, so the question is, should this be prohibited? Should this be prohibited? And then the opportunity to suggest other uses that should be allowed versus prohibited. Again, just to gauge community input, not to uh, make a decision. The results of that survey will be provided to the Neighbors Commission uh, as information, right? They're not going to dictate our decision. Uh, like any uh, body, we will make a decision. I'm not saying that they won't guide it. I just want to be clear that it's just information, as is all the community input at all of these meetings, et cetera. It's just another piece of information. Um, and then I was deferring to Larry Ames because he's a chair of the Neighborhoods Commission and he can speak more to what process the Neighborhoods Commission will follow. Also, uh, we collect information from you. If you want to email, email it to Ernest Guzman at, so do you want to yeah. spell it out? Uh, it was, uh, yeah, my email is uh, Ernest, E-R-N-E-S-T dot Guzman, G-U-C-M-A-N at San Jose CAF. Uh, let me also say something about the survey. Uh, each of the commissioners does uh, their own type of survey for their own community. None of them are scientific surveys. But they're anecdotal, the same way we're picking up anecdotal information today. So um, if you're asking about the veracity of a survey, aside from the fact that how you feel about an opinion, it's not going to be scientific. It'll be uh, the comments that come back. Um, with comments that are specific to this particular subject. So they'll be talking about drones I mean, it or UAS. Example, do you want a drone in your community or not? And that's a yes or no response. That's not a Correct. And yes, that pulled. question is included. And that it, it is, goes for it is included. I'm just, I'm just trying to figure it out because I know you guys play an important role as a voice in the community. So I just want to figure out how you're arriving at your recommendations. Yeah, so then this goes to the subcommittee of the city council and then to the full city council for decision. And this is a one-year pilot program for very specific uses. <coughs> and then after the one year, then they will, I guess, collect more information, learn lessons learned, and decide. I don't think that phase of it has been decided. Uh, and at this point, none of that has been decided either. Uh, I think to the chief's point, this is an ongoing process. This is to listen to you folks and then make a, another uh, potential change in the document. So it'll be a living document until it comes back with commission in, in March. Uh, to, um, uh, to Commissioner Estrada's point, um, the, uh, the date that will be agendized uh, for discussion and action will be the March 11th uh, commission meeting. Uh, because we won't have heard back until we heard, hear the uh, February uh, meeting in the community in the east side of San Jose. So we'll still be gathering information. And uh, to further uh, uh, back up what the, what the chief said, if at the end of February uh, it's decided that for whatever reason we haven't gathered enough information, uh, the flexibility is that we may decide to uh, Keep gathering information as the process moves forward, which may, may mean uh, we need uh, additional community meetings. So uh, it's it's an evolving, dynamic process. Um, as you can see with the attendance today, uh, even though this is certainly a nationwide discussion, uh, residents of San Jose are keenly interested and want to participate. And I think uh, the comments have been made by you folks that this is a good <coughs> process. Um, uh, that's certainly appreciated, but that is not the, um, the end-all, be-all of it. 
uh, this is a process that, that is really sincere in trying to gather the information from you that will make the best recommendations from the uh, police department to the, uh, to the residents and then eventually to the council. And I want to stress that whatever the commission says in terms of yes, this is a great process, no, we like certain pieces of it, we don't like other pieces, or no, we don't like the process. That'll be one recommendation that goes to the council. It'll be up to them to decide, as always, you know, what they want to do with it. Um, and I just want to add, just to um, elaborate on what Ernest is sharing, there, it sounds like there are concerns with not being informed and having an opportunity to voice your concerns, if any. The process is going to be a public process the entire way through. Um, and again, as Ernest said, the Neighborhoods Commission might come up with a de different recommendation than the police department, or they may be on the same page. Then it goes to the Public Safety, Finance, and Strategic Support Committee. They may be on the same page, and then it goes to council. All of those committees, all of the outreach, are opportunities for each one of you to show up, invite <coughs> people to speak, voice your concerns, or agree with what it is that, that um, the police department is proposing, or the city manager's office is proposing, any of the uh, players involved. The very final say, again, will come from the city council, and even at that meeting, which everybody will have sufficient notice of, you will have an opportunity to speak up. So regardless of what the uh, recommendation is from any department, it's at the city council meeting where the decision will be ultimately made, and it might very well be direction to us to go back and do <coughs> further information gathering, further studies. We don't know what's, what it's going to be, but your voice is always relevant. Your concerns are relevant to us. We listen to what you say, and we're doing as much research and information gathering <coughs> as we can. So all you need to do is reach out to any one of us here, the Neighborhoods Commission, the Public Safety Committee, your council member, reach out directly to me. Everything that you put forward, any concern you have, we will look at and consider. Nick, Nick Woloski, District 10, the Commission. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd like to ask that everybody in this room be a part of the process insofar as passing along the information as it relates to these public meetings when they're held, and uh, your opinion, of course, on nextdoor.com, on your own emailing list, your own colleagues, and through your own neighborhood associations to pass the word along so the seminal group of folks that are going to help make this decision are not necessarily just the folks sitting in this row and just the folks sitting up there it's all of us and uh, it is an asset it's not a we and them so uh any help that can be given by the members of the community in order to get this information along the best possible decision will be made by city council ultimately as was well described is the policy by comparison of uh, the medical marijuana uh, collective issue which has been ongoing for 10 years, which is now accumulating in policies being set by the city uh, as it relates to code enforcement being the way that they go about managing the marijuana collectives is something that came to this body and, uh, and the, 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 the uh, uh, legal offices in the, in the city and every other department involved, including code enforcement. And ultimately, I think good decisions are made out of that. So this process really does work. And we're trying like that. We're activist, uh, uh, an activist sort of organization where we're very active in reaching out to the community through everything from surveys through uh, all the other mechanisms that we described. So thanks, thanks so much. Hi, Dave Noel, Air Association again. Um, I wanted to ask about um, whether this device could or you would be used indoors. I didn't see that mentioned anywhere in the policy recommendations. <coughs> It can be used indoors. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to use it indoors because uh, uh, you, you need, to, as, as everybody, well, not everybody, but radio frequency, right? It, it doesn't like cement. It, it's got other issues and things happen. So yes, it can be used indoors. Um, it makes it a little bit more difficult to do that. Yeah, again, it's depending <coughs> upon the circumstance or where you have it, what the construction of the building is. Uh, we like to fly at line of sight. So um, I, I don't really see using that where it gets so into a building where mm -hmm. you get confused and you don't really know where it is. But yes, it has that capability. Yeah, I have uh, three points. It's like um, 
because we live in Silicon Valley, you know, we have a long history of, of dealing with technology. And um, one concern is, is that, and one gentleman kind of expressed it, is that technology is like a means for people to reach, attain certain desires. So the gentleman over there, he was saying, well, can we use these drones for code enforcement? This is what alarms me, you know, is that it's one more step to life. You know, it's like the city against the people, the police against the people. You know, um, so I just want to voice that. Second one is, I, you know, this, it seems like this is one more step in the militarization of the police, which is, you know, becoming a national trend now. Um, this alarms me. <coughs> Uh, the third thing is, is like, yes, I hear a lot about um, um, the, uh, the process, you know, the city's gathering information. Well, you know, my dealings of the city and with the police department is, you know, it, it seems overly cloaked in secrecy. Whether, and I, I realize, you know, that the police need to operate in some respects secretly. The city department, the city, on the other hand, you know, yes, they have a process, but the process is so cumbersome, it acts like an exclusion. So I just want to throw this out. Could I make a comment regarding code enforcement? Because that may have been misconstrued on how I uh, how I uh, presented that. No, it wasn't you. Oh, okay, very good. I just I want to know that as a student of George Orwell and all of his writings, including 1984, if this uh, device was going to be used for code enforcement and flying in people's backyards to see if you put on a uh, new addition or if you got pop growing back there, I'd be picking up one of the signs and uh, stepping off the commission to uh, uh, be vigorous and be combated. So uh, this is a very open and public process. And you can see this is the beginnings of that process. And uh, the cooperation you're going to see from members of the commission, the, the police, the city council, is going to be a, an open book. This is nothing close to secrecy here. Uh, it's, it's, and if I see something like that, uh, I'll be very vocal. And, and the scope is very clear. The scope is not changing anytime soon. Uh, Marilyn Rogers, again, I have a question. I'm not sure you can even answer it, but my concern is about the FAA because this is a new territory for them as well um, to, to look at not only drones that uh, police departments might be using, but public entities using it and individuals. Has the FAA, you said that they, you were hoping they were going to have recommendations or guidelines coming out, and that usually is a very long process, and have they asked for public input, or where are they in the process, do you know? So in the research that I've done, I, I've read some different things, <clears throat> excuse me, and I understand that they were supposed to have guidelines that were going to come out in 2015. In regard to the public outreach, I'm not sure what they have or have not done in that regard. Um, I, like I said before, the FAA is mostly concerned with the airspace, um, and so they're really looking at regulating the airspace more than the, the privacy issues or other concerns that I think people airspace, have. Airspace, pilots, etc. Right. Airspace and pilots and those kinds of things. I came in late, uh, perhaps you discussed this, but I so far haven't heard you address why the police department bought the drone secretly in the first place without any public input. It's my understanding that the, to the public was because the ACLU was doing a study and they had to work hard to find out what had already been bought, um, unbeknownst to some of the council members. Why should we have faith and why, why is everyone so impressed with the process starting now? Why is it starting now? Why didn't it start? before, or did you address that? No, uh, so thank you for the question. Um, we actually, when we procured the UAS, we did it through a uh, grant process wherein we put in requests for it, um, and then it went before council on a consent item, so it was before council, um, and so clearly we've learned from that we, um, then have brought it to the public as a result of that. There were some Public Records Act requests asking about the, the UAS, and um, we have brought it forward now, um, and we weren't trying to do anything secretly. We went through the process that oftentimes we do go through through technology. Um, but admittedly, 
Uh, we should have been more aware of the uh, community sensitivity to this specific device. And uh, that's why we are currently now reaching out and uh, gaining the input from the community. Uh, just a follow-up on uh, records. Uh, my understanding is the Department of